This is the international relations revision session for chapters one to three for the uh, December mock exam. Chapters one and two are relevant for context mainly, but the key aspect is chapter three. And the key focus for these chapters is looking at why World War I broke out in 1914. Chapters one and two are important, particularly in relation to issues such as the, the reinsurance treaty, for example. But in terms of key content, that's where chapter three is where the course starts proper in 1890 onwards. Now, what I will do in this is read through at a normal pace, really, rather than pause. And in taking your own notes, I would suggest that what you then do is pause at certain points. The key aspect as part of this is a memory test, is what the revision should be. Use the book and use this revision sample to help you. But ultimately, for chapter three, your key focus is why World War I broke out and all of the different factors' contributions to war. Now, in terms of nationalism, what you have really, is, in terms of imperialism, there's an Asia and Africa scramble from the major European powers. It doesn't lead to war, but it does increase the sense of militarism, imperialism and nationalism that's amongst the powers that increases rivalry significantly. In the Upper Ireland for Shoda crisis, Britain and France potentially clashed. There was a potential clash at for Shoda, but bizarrely actually led to an improvement in relations and also the French allowing Britain to dominate Egypt and gain at the same time British Morocco, British backing for French action in Morocco. So Britain and France were willing to make concessions to each other where it benefited each other's imperial ambitions. In South Africa, what you start to see here is a clash between Britain and Germany. Britain was concerned about German economic influence in the Transvaal, particularly since they found gold in the region, and that the key problem was that Germany could block the northern expansion into Africa, in Africa uh, for British colonies. So Britain was threatened by this. Germany feared the British sea power in Transvaal. In this incident, the Germans were restricted from progressing further and taking more decisive action because of the British power over the seas. There was a potential military clash, and what they essentially the Germans settled themselves for in the end was a congratulatory telegram to Kruger. This really angered the British and led to anti-German British and political feeling. There were protests against anti-German against German shops, for example. Britain felt that Germany was meddling in its empire. A few years later, the Boer War was essentially Britain ultimately succeeding against Kruger and the Boers, but taking quite a long time to do so in a drawn-out war. And what stopped German, France, Germany, France and Russia from cooperating against the British was this fear of the British naval power in terms of getting troops to the area and supplying them. And Germany, Russia and France couldn't agree to cooperate against Britain and take advantage of the situation. Now, another issue in the Far East, in China, Britain responded to the Russian threat to its dominance of Chinese trade, which was the Russian threat involved its ability to transcend troops to China on the Trans-Siberian Railway. And Britain agreed a defensive alliance with Japan in response to this threat. And what they were doing in that sense is support British interests in China in terms of trade and Japanese influence in Korea. All of this increased tension in Europe as there was potentially an agreement between Britain and, and Japan to help each other in the event of two powers going to war against either Britain or Japan. So for example, if Japan was involved in a war against Russia, if France became involved in that war, then potentially Britain could be at war with France, which was a nightmare scenario. The alliance system is an absolutely fundamental feature of the, the build-up to World War I, as it's what triggers it from a local war into a full-scale European war. In the years prior to 1907, 
There was a diplomatic revolution which isolated Germany and divided Europe into two rival alliances. What emerged was a German and Austro-Hungarian alliance and the Triple Entente of Britain, France and Russia, which although not an alliance between the three of them, was a significant development in terms of their relations. Prior to this, the British Empire had been vulnerable to German, Russian and French cooperation. But this diplomatic revolution changed the scene significantly in Europe. There were a number of reasons for this development of this, these two rival alliances. Anglo-German economic and naval rivalry was a key feature of this. Britain's commercial and industrial dominance across the world was threatened by Germany. Germany had undergone a second industrial revolution in effect in terms of chemical, electrical and engineering industries. Germany was also the third largest creditor nation and it also had significantly increased production of steel and iron. It was a dominant f f factor in the Middle East, South, Afri South Africa and South American trade. So Germany was ever an increasing economic rival. Germany feared being shut out of Britain's economic markets and as a result of this drove for increased colonies because Britain at any time could respond by blocking trade with Germany with its enormous naval and imperial advantage. Another feature of this rivalry between Britain and Germany was a naval race. Britain's empire and trade was threatened by German expansion and what, for example, the Germans were doing was building a plan for 60 battleships in 20 years to threaten Britain in the North Sea. And there was an increasing German nationalism in the country. The tension was increasing when Britain, under pressure, agreed to build 18 new dreadnoughts, which were the new types of battleships, which essentially moved Britain forwards but made all of the ships at that time obsolete. These 18 new dreadnoughts were to be built between 1909 and 1911. This was to keep ahead of Germany's 16 battleships over four years, the proposals for building. The agreements um, were torpedoed by Britain's refusal to stay neutral in the event of German war against Russia and France. What well, Britain essentially were... Key certainly decided upon is that they could not remain neutral in a European war that allowed German domination of Europe. Now in terms of the Anglo-German relations deteriorating, a key step in this was the uh, the Anglo-French Entente, or as it's affectionately known, Entente. Largely this was an agreement to satisfy colonial interests of both countries. It was not an alliance but what it did was it avoided the nightmare scenario of being dragged into a war as the seconds of Russia or Japan. Britain overlooked uh, the French domination of Morocco as French um, was the French order at this time in Morocco was preferable to chaos in the country. French wanted Britain in actually to join the dual alliance with Russia, but Britain aimed to remain independent of Europe and had an independence of decision. There was, however, a violent German reaction over the French Morocco claim and French Moroccan domination. Essentially, what this was, it was getting very much closer to an Anglo French alliance. Although not established, it was definitely becoming nearer as a result of German, the German response to the Moroccan crisis. The Moroccan crisis was, was, was crucial in moving Germany further into isolation. Despite forcing the French Foreign Minister Del Castro to resign following opposition to French control in Morocco, and the July uh, 1905 Russo German Defensive Alliance, which was signed at Bjorko, Russia didn't actually ratify this treaty and Britain came down on the French side in the Moroccan crisis. This was actually a significant step towards war as 
Franco-German War seemed a real possibility at this time, and it was the first time really since 1870-71 war that this seemed possible, this, this war between France and Germany. The German military was ready to go to war. The Schlieffen Plan in 1905 established that Germany would attack France before then attacking Russia and avoid a two-front war. They deemed that Russia was weak economically and was poorly equipped, and France was also poorly equipped in terms of its economic, um, sorry, poorly equipped in terms of its military materials. In 1907, the Anglo-Russian Entente focused on again on both countries' colonial matters. So this is a clear indication that Britain's interests are still largely colonial. For example, um, Afghanistan and North India was recognised in Britain's favour and Persia, elements of Persia were recognised for Russia. It was not a formal alliance and there were still tensions, for example, in Persia. But fundamentally, this changed the balance of power in Europe as Germany couldn't assume that an Anglo-Russian war would break out over colonies and force one to be, uh, Germany wouldn't be able to force one of those countries to be a subordinate ally in a European war. There were signs of improved Anglo-German relations at this time, but these collapsed over French influence in Morocco. Part of this, German Foreign Secretary von uh, sorry, German Foreign Secretary, not, not getting his words out here, von Kielin Wachter was increasingly aggressive in German foreign policy. Bit of a blip. Now, the second Morocco crisis of 1911 was also a major step towards war and, and a huge contributory factor. It showed that the Germans were willing to risk naval and military action in response to French domination of Morocco. Potential German gains through negotiation with France were scuppered by British intervention in the crisis because Britain feared German diplomatic success and also a weakening of the Entente. This was seen as an ultimatum to Germany as Britain had major interests in the Moroccan region and were not willing to allow the Germans to have success in this area. Germany was in effect backed into a corner and only secured minus concessions from the French in the French Congo in exchange for French influence in Morocco. Now, as part of one of the impact of the Moroccan crisis, an arms race developed between Germany, France and Britain and increasing tension was prevalent. Germany increased its army by 140,000 men in 1912 to 1913. Britain at the same time was experiencing the Navy League and the National Service League putting pressure on the government to increase naval size and to develop uh, an armed force where in which men would become involved in national service and become prepared for armed force duty. France at the same time increased its length of conscription from two to three years and modernised its artillery and equipment. At the same time, Russia was spending, between 1913 and 14, was spending 800 million rubles a year on rearmament and planned to have an armed force of 2 million men by June 1914. Another feature of the Moroccan crisis was that the Entente was, strength was strengthened with French, Russian naval and army talks, Anglo-French naval talks, although still not an alliance in 1912, but they did agree in this year to meet if either country was attacked. So it was getting closer to an alliance, but it wasn't established. Britain still retained independence of decision. At the end of 1912, a key development was that stronger rival alliances existed and that Germany was clinging to its Austrian ally. And all the while, the Balkans were potentially a spark for a war. While the rival alliances were developing, any kind of conflict in the Balkans could emerge into a major European war. It's the Balkans which we'll focus on now, which ultimately is what triggers World War One. It is a minefield, it's a powder keg, 
but it would provide this spark for war. It's a very complicated set of events which could easily turn into description. So the key is to focus on the impact of the Balkan crisis on the major powers, the great European powers, and the steps towards war. In 1905, Austria exploited Russian weakness to weaken Serbia and its anti-Austrian policy. This Serbian policy was aimed at freeing the South Slavs in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austria annexed Bosnia-Hungary in 1908, and although this was agreed in principle by Russia, it caused a storm of protest, especially in Russia and the pro-Slav elements in Russia, who would be back in Serbia. And obviously it caused a huge storm of protest in Serbia. Russia attempted to backtrack, but this was rebuffed by Austria-Hungary. And Austria was clearly ready to fight Serbia, even if Russia was involved too. Germany unconditionally backed Austria, which was crucial in the development of war. So excuse the, uh, the password, freezing. This at this time was prevented by escalation by the French not backing the Russians due to what was happening in that period, which was negotiations with Germany over Morocco. So the Russians were obviously angered by this, but actually it stopped a crisis escalating further. If the French had decided to back the Russians, things could have developed. The impact of all of this was that Russia was increasingly separated from Germany and Austria and Russia was also drawn closer to Serbia. Now, a key spark for the war was the First Balkan War, which could lead to a larger European war. There was an escalation in tension following the Balkan states combining to attack the Turkish Empire. The Balkan nation squabbles was a major part in the outbreak of war, as it triggered the rival alliances in Europe. So, for example, Serbia being supported by Russia and Austria being supported by Germany and obviously France then supporting Russia. Russia clearly supported Serbia and were concerned with Bulgarian strength in the region. At the same time, Austria were concerned about Albania issue with Serbia. They wanted control over Albania and they disputed this region with Serbia and Austria was prepared to move troops to the Russian border in an aggressive step. Germany and France would stand behind her allies, that was clear. And Germany promised to support Austria-Hungary at this time and this was answered by a British statement of not remaining neutral in the event of war. While all this was happening Von Moltke and the German armed forces were pushing for war imminently, as being in Germany's interests. The satisfaction of Austria and Russia in 1913 at the Treaty of London was not shared by Bulgaria. They felt cheated by the Treaty of London in this, um, what had been the concessions from the Turkish, the collapse of the Turkish Empire. They felt cheated of territory and the key... Oh, hiya, so there you are. I'm just doing a... Sorry for that little interruption. The key impact of Bulgarian aggressive response was the union of other Balkan powers in defiance of Bulgaria and it was in response to Bulgarian aggression. And essentially what we're starting to see is the strength of Serbia emerging from this defeat of Bulgaria. And this is what concerned Austria at this time. So again, it's a situation where the Balkans is call, having an impact on other European powers because we're seeing situations emerge that concern countries such as Austria. It's in this context that the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand triggers European war. The assassination gave Austria-Hungary the, Hungary the excuse to eliminate Serbian threat to Bosnian and the South Slavs. 
Now the South Slavs, remember, are in this in Austrian-Hungarian territory. The German blank check on the 5th of July 1914 was absolutely crucial in starting the war, as this essentially gives Austria increasing confidence that they can take action against Serbia with German support. The Austro-Hungarian gamble failed. They were expecting that a localised war with no Russian intervention could take place. And Germany's aim in all of this in giving support for Austria was actually to improve relations with the Entente from a position of strength. There are actually many that in Germany it would be spoiling for a war, but there are still people, especially in the German parliament, that were not set on war. This was a fatal error in all of this. There were misunderstandings that took place of the Russian reaction and their support for Serbia and the Slavs. They underestimated their response. Another fatal area for Austria was to be too slow in taking action against Serbia. This is where the Hungarians, took, as the minor partner in this empire, impressed upon the Austrians that they should give an ultimatum to Serbia rather than attack outright. Austria then made it almost impossible to accept an ultimatum, as essentially they were spoiling for war. They included, in their terms, an ability to take part in anti-terror measures in Serbia, which would effectively give them control of the Serbian security forces. Although the Serbians managed to skillfully reject the terms, but not be too um, hostile in their response, Austria took the opportunity on the 28th of June to declare war on, sorry, on 28th of July to declare war on Serbia. Russians responded immediately with mobilisation, this despite doubts from the Tsar and the Kaiser's plea to avoid mobilisation. Germany had to act quickly due to the Schlieffen plan that they put in place. France had to be attacked first and then defeated before Russia could mobilise within six weeks. It was crucial for the support of the German working class for the government during the war that Russia mobilised first and that Germany could issue an ultimatum effectively saying that they were acting out of self-defence. France had little choice but to mobilise. They couldn't let Germany defeat its ally Russia and essentially dominate Europe with this new strength of having been emerged victorious from a war with Russia. Germany also had to act fast to maintain the Schlieffen plan. Essentially there wasn't enough will in Europe to stop this cataclysm that was engulfing the whole of the continent. The German violation of Belgium was ultimately the event that removed British deliberations and doubt and led to them uh, declaring war on Germany on the 4th of August 1914. The war party in England as it commonly became known was essentially government members and members of the public that were aiming for Britain to get involved in a European war as opposed to staying out of the conflict. It would have been very difficult for Britain to allow Germany to dominate Europe by defeating France and Russia. So ultimately, why did war break out in 1914? Previous crises in the Balkans and Morocco had not led to conflict between the Dual Alliance and the Triple Entente, but yet they did in 1914. Arguably, each crisis increased the likelihood of war. The two Moroccan crises did much to bring together Britain and France, while France's failure to back Russia in the Bosnian crisis of 1908 and Russia's subsequent humiliation at the hands of Austria and Germany strengthened both Poincaré's resolve to support Russia next time and Russia's determination to stop the destruction of Serbia in July 1914. The Great Powers did cooperate in containing the fallout from the two Balkan Wars, but nevertheless the emergence of a greatly strengthened Serbia in 1913, with its claims on Bosnia-Herzegovina, was a deadly threat to the Habsburg Empire. And the following year, Austria went to war to cr crush this Serbian rise. 
The constant international tension had created a mood throughout Europe that war was sooner or later inevitable. And that the main thing was to choose the right moment for the struggle to start. For different reasons and at different stages, that moment seemed to have been reached, reached in July 1914. The Sarajevo assassination brought together all the explosive tensions in Europe. Germany could not allow its only reliable ally, Austria-Hungary, to be humiliated by Serbia and Russia. Once Germany declared war on Russia, France could not stand back and see Russia defeated. While Britain, despite initial hesitations, could not afford to run the risk of a German victory. The decisions of the statesmen were backed for the most part by their people, who saw the war as a struggle and a matter of honour and principle to preserve their nation's independence, greatness and future development. That is seen in the response to war where you have massive signing up for their armed forces and celebrations in the streets which were not repeated in World War Two. Blame has been apportioned in different courts for World War One. Largely it's been, for the most part, um, left at Germany's door. While Germany's not solely responsible, because you must consider it's the whole European tension through imperialism, alliances, nationalism and militarism, Germany does have a significant role to play, especially in the offering of the blank check to Austria-Hungary. But it should all be also be considered that the new course in German foreign policy was highly important. Going back to 1890, the end of the Reinsurance Treaty had significant consequences for Europe as it represented the end of Bismarck's policy of complicated checks and balances to keep peace between the major powers. This new policy of attempting to associate Britain with Italy and Austria-Hungary was a more aggressive step which served to isolate Russia, which pushed Russia closer towards its defensive alliance with France. Germany was now, it believed, in a position to take more aggressive foreign policy actions due to its increased economic and military strength in 1890, which had the consequences of creating a greater divide between the rival European nations. Germany miscalculated Britain's willingness to join the Triple Alliance as they believed that pressure on Britain's large and vulnerable empire would lead it into agreements with Germany and its allies. They're obviously wrong. However, Britain was not prepared to negotiate binding alliances and believed that defending Germany and Austria-Hungary against Russia would be a liability. This miscalculation had the ultimate effect of Germany becoming dependent upon its alliance with Austria-Hungary which meant that Austria could put pressure on Germany to back them against Russia in the next Balkan crisis. This increased tension in Europe and further created divisions between the developing rival alliances in Europe and made Austria more willing to take aggressive actions in the Balkans given their closer alliance with Germany. This again would bring them into direct conflict with Russia. The new course in German foreign policy from 1890 onwards at the ending of the reinsurance treaty inadvertently led the French and Russians into a defensive alliance as the Russians believed that the Kaiser's state visit to Britain in 1901 was actually the signing of an alliance. The Franco-Russian defensive military agreement in 1894 was a disaster for the future of Europe because it ensured that any conflict involving France or Russia would lead to a larger scale European war. It also increased German suspicions due to its secret nature as Germany believed that France and Russia would be allies in a future war, leading to even closer contact between Germany and its key ally Austria. Skipping forward to 1914, this is the forerunning, forerunner of the, 19, of the blank check that's offered by Germany to Austria-Hungary during the Balkans crisis. The end of French isolation by signing the dual alliance with Russia was what Bismarck would have considered to be a disaster for German foreign policy, as Germany was now surrounded on both sides by a potential hostile alliance. 
the new course in German foreign policy in seeking agreement with Britain and ending the Russian reinsurance treaty led to a situation in which Germany and Russia became estranged and were both linked to rival alliances in Europe. Germany's huge miscalculation in anticipating that Britain would be open to an agreement ending Bismarck's complicated policy of using treaties to maintain peace and heighten Russian suspicions to the extent they agreed a defensive alliance with France. Ultimately, any conflict in the volatile Balkans would now lead to a wider European war with rivals in the region, Austria-Hungary and Russia, pressuring their allies, Germany and France, into honouring their defensive agreements.